So my name is Leanne. I'm one of the ultrasound faculty here at Sick Kids, and we're going to talk a little bit about small bowel obstruction and point of care ultrasound assessment this morning. And feel free to ask us any questions uh, if you're joining us online. So objectives for today: we're hoping to understand the indications for ultrasound for bowel obstruction, and we're also going to look a little bit at the sonographic findings in bowel obstruction and touch briefly on fecal retention at the very end. So when we think about um, small bowel, what we're thinking about is something that is moving and peristalsing all of the time. So this is an ultrasound of normal bowel contents. You can see there's air there with these bright sort of white shadows. There's movement of some sort of hypo and hyperechoic material. There's peristalsis there as well. Uh, and this small bowel right in the middle of the picture sitting next to the ascending colon. So you can, you can see the, the gutter as well on the side of the colon there. So this is what a normal bowel looks like. But when we say normal bowel, we know that there's lots of different types of normal bowel that we can see. We can also see air. This is an air-filled ascending colon. It's important to remember that air does exist within the bowel and think about it as something that moves around with the bowel contents inside the lumen itself. So visualizing that lumen really nice and clearly and then seeing that air underneath. Um, we just spent some time going over a chapter looking at neck in neonates and it can be really hard to differentiate air within the bowel wall and free air. So just try and Recognize your normal anatomy and practice as much as you can so that when something's abnormal, you can pick it up easier. So when we think about empty small bowel, kind of our traditional small bowel in a healthy child, it really is like a maze. It can move around. It's this big sort of central conglomeration of uh, a long, long tube. And so what we're going to try and do is we're going to try and approach it in a systematic way. So the systematic way that we recommend is what we sort of call lawn mowing of the abdomen. So it's really going in an intentional and comprehensive way across the entire abdominal wall to try and visualize areas that might be suspicious when we have a high pretest probability or a history that's consistent with small bowel obstruction. So when we think about it, what we're looking at is this normal maze of collapsed bowel. We're seeing lots of different areas. They're squishy, they're movable, they're compressible, and they're not causing any pain when we're looking at them. Some of the walls will be collapsing on each other. Some will have bowel contents going through them. So again, getting used to that normal variety of your bowel is going to be really important. So when do we suspect small bowel obstruction? Many of you will know this because you'll be familiar with the clinical picture, but we think about it when patients come in with abdominal distension, nausea, and vomiting. That vomit may also be bilious, suggesting something lower down in the GI tract. And often there can be a history of intra-abdominal surgery, leading to a risk of adhesions where this bowel can get sort of trapped and twisted and kinked on. How good are we at ultrasound for small bowel obstruction? So this study was done in 2013, and it was a meta-analysis looking at ultrasound compared to x-ray, CT, or MRI. And what it found was actually that ultrasound, and this is ultrasound performed by radiologists, uh, performed better than all other modalities for small bowel obstruction. So this lays really nice groundwork to suggest that we should be thinking about ultrasound for small bowel obstruction, and particularly at the bedside if we have a high pretest probability for a variety of reasons. So then the next question becomes, how good are we at ultrasound compared to our radiology colleagues? So this study in 2010, which I encourage you guys to read, looked at comparing emergency medicine residents to radiology residents for small bowel obstruction. The study was in adults as well, uh, and it was six hours of training looking at the two different groups. What they found was the diagnostic accuracy was not significantly different, and that out of the 90 positive scans on POCUS ultrasound, 84 of them had surgical findings consistent with uh, small bowel obstruction with a surgical cause. So it really just goes back to say that if you've got that high pretest probability, you know, we always preach that we can be taught, and I would argue that we do a pretty good job of it, especially if we compare peer-to-peer -peer with other specialties. So what are we looking at? What we're looking for, really, is features that we're seeing in this picture. So things like large, fluid-filled areas, 
of bell. And we'll talk a little bit about the bell wall thickness as well. Static moving bell, so either absent or abnormal peristalsis, and abnormal findings surrounding that bowel itself. Now, you might have noticed through these first pictures that we're taking them with a variety of different probes. And this is important to think about. So really any probe can work. You can use your linear, your curvilinear, or your phased array, depending on how deep you want to get and how large your patient is. Often in the younger kids, we will use a linear probe, but you're certainly welcome to use the probe of your choice because you'll see small bowel abnormalities, both deep and shallow. We see abnormal peristalsis, which we joke is called poo and fro. And really that's what it is. It's this movement of back and forth because your peristalsis is moving up against a stationary object or an obstruction. As well, you'll see dilation of the small bowel. And so our adult number to think about is greater than two and a half centimeters. And that has been shown in some studies to be sort of the most sensitive finding for small bowel obstruction in the adult population. If you're getting fancy and you're trying to differentiate between jejunal and ileal obstruction, jejunum often has more prominent and more numerous valvula conventes, whereas your ileum will lack the finding of those valvula conventes. So when we think about the spectrum of obstruction, we think about a few things. So this patient came into our emergency department uh, and they were post-operative for an abdominal operation. And what happened was they had abdominal pain and a little bit of vomiting. They had this on the ultrasound and there was concern there might be some evidence of a partial obstruction. They were still passing gas, so they weren't completely obstructed. They were consulted general surgery and they trialed them on PO and they were able to tolerate fluids. And so they sent them home. But what I want to point out here is that what we're seeing is this sort of whooshing back and forth of the luminal content. So you don't really see that kind of really regular peristalsis, but there is movement of the bowel wall itself here. And as intraluminal pressure increases, the increased bowel diameter will push the wall muscles past that effective contraction point, And then you're going to have that impeded movement, which is going to be your ileus and then impeded blood flow because of this pressure. And then it's going to get sicker. It's not going to peristalse. You're going to get sort of that wall edema and you're going to start to develop your ischemia. So again, let's bring it back to sort of our physiology principles and thinking about how our ileus is going to be caused. So the patient came back the next day and this is our scan the next day. So unlike that movement where you saw the bowel wall trying to contract and push her bowel contents through, now we're seeing increasing abdominal distension on our clinical examination. And when we take a look here with our low frequency probe, we can see transmitted aortic pulsation of the gut content and also that really kind of static nature of the bowel itself. So the only real movement you're seeing is that transferred movement from the aorta. So really, really sort of a progression on that spectrum of the same patient representing. So she got admitted to surgery on this presentation. They did manage her conservatively, so there was no operative management, but they just did some bowel rest and then restarted some fluids for her. But I think it's a really nice illustration of sort of that spectrum that we might see.